Hello and welcome back to Abstract Linear Algebra, the video course where we talk a lot about advanced topics in linear algebra. And indeed, in today's part 38, we will go more into the direction of the so-called Jordan normal form. And in order to do that, we will talk about invariant subspaces. We will see that for every matrix we can define them and then the transformation to the Jordan normal form is possible. However, before we start with the important definition of today, let's first thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. Only because of your support, I'm still able to create such math videos. And please don't forget, as a reward, you can download a lot of additional material with the link in the description. And now without further ado, let's immediately start with the definition of an invariant subspace. And indeed, we can formulate it for any general vector space V. And then the term invariant is always seen with respect to a given linear map L. This means L maps V into V again. This means what we have here is just a linear transformation of the vector space V. Of course, the dimension of V could be really high, but let's sketch it like that. And now we could consider a whole subspace in V here on the left hand side. So let's say this is our subspace U. And now since L is a linear map, this subspace will be transformed into a subspace again. In other words, the image of U under L is a subspace in V as well. So this is not so special and not hard to show, but we could have a well chosen subspace U in the sense that it does not change much when we apply our linear map L. And indeed, these are the subspaces we call invariant. More precisely, we should say the subspace is invariant under the linear map L. And the definition is quite simple. The image of U lies completely in U again. So the subspace L of U is either equal of U or a subspace in U. This means such a whole rotation of a subspace like in the picture is not possible for an invariant subspace. You might recognize this is similar to eigenvectors, but now the claim is for a whole subspace U. And for such a special subspace U, we can immediately write down an important consequence. Namely, we can restrict our linear map L to the subspace U and we get a new linear map. There you could say, this linear map sends the vector space U into itself. So you see, an invariant subspace allows us to analyze our linear map inside this given subspace. And exactly this is what we can use when we want to decompose a matrix into so-called Jordan blocks. Hence, this will be our important application of these invariant subspaces. And there please recall our linear map L is just given by a square matrix A. And moreover, we know such a matrix has at least one eigenvalue in C and let's fix one and call it lambda. And from the last video, we have already learned that we have so-called generalized eigenspaces that form a chain. This means we have kernels which increase in each step. And the first one in the chain is just the ordinary eigenspace where we already know it's non-trivial. And then we know we can increase the power until we reach the so-called fitting index. And the name I choose for this index is a lowercase d. This means if we now consider a kernel with an even higher power, we will not change this one at all. Hence the minimal possibility for the fitting index is 1 and the maximal possibility would be the dimension n. So this is important to remember, d always lies between 1 and n. Indeed, different matrices can have different fitting indices. Okay, so this was the description of the generalized eigenspaces, but it turns out, as we have shown in the last video, that we have the same chain for the ranges. The only difference is that now the ranges get smaller when we increase our exponent. Otherwise, it looks exactly the same and we end at our fitting index d. And now the important thing is that these two subspaces at the end should be invariant under our matrix A. And in fact, it's not so hard to prove at all. So we just have to show if we apply our matrix A to the given subspace, we stay in this subspace. 
And now, as you can see, obviously, it might be easier to work with the matrix A minus lambda identity. But obviously, as you can see, this is not a big difference, because if we apply a vector x to this matrix, then we can split it up and we have A times x minus lambda times x. So if we have x in a given subspace u, and we can show that a minus lambda times identity times x also lies in u, then the equation on the left tells us that ax is given as a linear combination of two elements of u. So more concretely, this first vector here lies in u, and lambda times x definitely also lies in u. So the conclusion is a times x also lies in u, so we can check the invariance of the subspace by simply checking for a minus lambda times identity instead of a. This makes our whole proof here much simpler, because if we substitute this matrix by the letter n, then all the notations are much shorter. So that the first thing we show here is that our kernel of n to the power d is invariant under n. So the only thing we have to do here is to take an element x from this kernel and then we apply the matrix n and check if the result is still in this kernel. Hence, applying n to the power d to nx should give us the zero vector. And now the question is simply, do we immediately get it? And indeed we do, because we can rewrite it as n applied to n to the power d x. And for this one, we already know it lies in the kernel, so this one is already the zero vector. And then applying n to the zero vector, let us stay at the zero vector. So the result is not so surprising, n times x also lies in the kernel. And please note, this is exactly what we wanted to show. The kernel of n to the power d is invariant under the matrix n. And therefore also invariant under our original matrix A. Therefore, the only thing that remains to show now is that the range is also invariant under n. So it's exactly the same idea. Let's take a vector y in the range of n to the power d. And then let's check if n times y also lies in this subspace. And in order to show that, we have to use what it means to be in a range of a matrix. Indeed, it just means that we find a pre-image x that belongs to this given y. So in formulas, y is written as n to the power d times x. And obviously this is what we can use when we want to analyze n times y. So we don't have to do much, we can just put it in. And then as before, we can just exchange the two matrices, and then we have n to the power d times n times x. So we just have to see that n times x is our new pre-image, and we can call it x tilde. So n times y has the same form as y, so it also lies in the range of n to the power d. And with that we are already done. Also the range is invariant under n and therefore under a. And in the proof you might have seen that the power we have chosen for n was not so important, so it also works for different powers and not just for the fitting index. However, the claim we have written down here is really important for the fitting index, as we will see in the next video. There, these invariant subspaces will allow us to decompose our matrix A into Jordan blocks. However, this is definitely something for the next video. So I really hope I meet you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.